on April 25, 1986. A single button push sealed the fate of millions. But the disaster at Chernobyl didn't start with the explosion. It started with a chain of seemingly small errors, a deeply flawed design, and a cascade of events that made the world's worst nuclear catastrophe almost inevitable. The Vladimir Ilyich Lenin nuclear power plant, known to most as Chernobyl, stood as a monument to Soviet ambition. Tucked away in northern Ukraine, near the purpose-built city of Pripyat, it was one of the USSR's most modern and powerful plants. Pripyat itself was an atom town, a privileged city of almost 50,000 people who enjoyed a quality of life well above the Soviet average. For them, it was a day like any other filled with anticipation for the upcoming May Day holiday. On the schedule for that day was what everyone thought was a routine safety test. The test was meant to answer a simple question. If the plant lost all power, could the spinning down steam turbines generate enough leftover electricity to power the emergency water pumps for the 60 seconds it would take for the diesel generators to kick in? The test was considered so standard that the plant's director didn't even feel the need to be present. It was a test of a safety system, an ironic prelude to an unparalleled disaster. The procedure was supposed to start during the day shift. The plan was to slowly power down reactor number four from its normal 3,200 megawatts to a more stable 700 megawatts for the test. The power down began at 1 a.m. on April 25th, but by the afternoon, a call came from the Kyiv grid controller. Another power station had unexpectedly gone offline and they needed Chernobyl to stay on the grid to meet evening demand. The test was put on hold. The day shift went home, the evening shift came and went. That delay meant the test would now fall to the night shift, a far less experienced crew that hadn't been prepped on the test's specific and unusual procedures. Finally, at 11.10 p.m., the grid controller gave the all clear. The operators in control room four, now supervised by Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov, began reducing the reactor's power again. What they didn't know was that deep inside the reactor core, a hidden poison was building, setting the first trap in a long chain of catastrophic failures. Shortly after midnight on April 26th, the operators hit their first major problem. As they tried to level the reactor out at the target of 700 megawatts, the power suddenly plummeted to just 30 megawatts. The reactor was on the verge of shutting down completely the cause? A phenomenon known as xenon-135 poisoning. To understand what happened next, we have to look at the physics inside the core. A nuclear reactor is just a controlled chain reaction. Neutrons hit uranium-235 atoms, they split, and they release energy and more neutrons, which split more atoms. But this reaction also creates byproducts. One of the most important is iodine-135. Iodine-135 isn't a big deal on its own, but with a half-life of about six and a half hours, it decays into something else, xenon-135. Xenon-135 is like a sponge for neutrons. It's the most powerful neutron absorber known to science, and it essentially poisons the chain reaction by soaking up the very neutrons needed to keep it going. During normal high power operation, the reactor creates so many neutrons that this xenon is burned off as fast as it's created, keeping everything in perfect balance. But when the reactor power was held at 50% for hours and then dropped even lower, that balance was shattered. Iodine kept decaying into xenon, but now there weren't enough neutrons to burn it away. This buildup is what choked the reactor and caused the power to collapse. The operators now faced a choice. Safety regulations were clear. The reactor should have been shut down. But Dyatlov, feeling immense pressure to get the test done, refused. He ordered his operators, Leonid Toptunov and Alexander Akimov, to raise the power back up. 
a decision with devastating consequences. To fight the xenon poisoning, they started pulling control rods out of the reactor core. Control rods are the reactor's brakes. Made of neutron-absorbing boron, lowering them slows the reaction, and raising them speeds it up. Over the next hour, the operators pulled out more and more rods, far beyond the minimum safe operating number of 30. By 1 a.m., they'd managed to get the power stable at just 200 megawatts, nowhere near the 700 they wanted. To get there, they had almost completely disarmed the reactor's safety systems. The core was now in an extremely unstable state, but they decided to press on with the test anyway. To stop the reactor from automatically shutting down, they then disabled several more critical safety systems, including the emergency core cooling system. At 1.23 and 4 seconds a.m., the test officially began. The steam to the turbine was cut. As the turbine began to slow down, so did the water pumps it powered, reducing the flow of cooling water to the core. Inside this type of reactor, the RBMK-1000, this created another deadly problem, the positive void coefficient. In simple terms, the cooling water also absorbs some neutrons, but as it heats up and turns into steam, it creates voids or bubbles. In the RBMK's design, these steam voids absorb fewer neutrons than water does. This meant more neutrons were suddenly available to cause fission. So more steam meant a faster reaction, which created more heat, which created even more steam. It was a terrifying positive feedback loop. With the coolant flow now reduced for the test, steam voids began to form rapidly and the reactor's power began to surge uncontrollably. Seeing the power spike at 1.23 and 40 seconds, Akimov hit the AZ-5 button, the emergency scram button designed to shut everything down by driving all the control rods back into the core at once. It was the last ditch effort to save the reactor. But what nobody in that room seemed to fully understand was that this final act of safety was the very thing that triggered the explosion. The RBMK control rods had a fatal design flaw a secret so dangerous that it wasn't even widely known among the plant's operators. The rods were made of neutron-absorbing boron carbide, but they weren't solid. To save money, the 7-metre boron section was attached to a 4.5-metre graphite displacer at the bottom. And graphite doesn't slow a reaction, it speeds it up. When the control rods were almost fully withdrawn, as most of them were that night, the empty channels were filled with water. But when the AZ-5 button was pushed, the first thing to enter the superheated core wasn't the neutron-absorbing boron, but the 4.5-metre graphite tips. This action pushed the neutron-absorbing water out of the bottom of the core and replaced it with reaction-boosting graphite. In an already surging reactor, this was like pouring gasoline on a fire. In the seconds after the AZ-5 button was pushed, the data tells a horrifying story. The graphite tips entering the core caused an enormous power surge at the bottom of the reactor. Instead of shutting down, the reactor's power skyrocketed. Within three seconds, it jumped past 530 megawatts. Then it leaped to an estimated 30,000 megawatts, 10 times the reactor's normal maximum output. Some estimates put the surge even higher. The intense heat shattered the fuel rods. At 1.23 and 58 seconds a.m., a massive steam explosion ripped the reactor apart. The 1,000-ton steel and concrete lid, the biological shield, was blown clean off, flipping up into the air before crashing back down into the core. Now open to the air, the superheated graphite ignited a few seconds later, a second, more powerful explosion tore through the building, spewing a plume of fire, smoke, and intensely radioactive debris high into the night sky. Inside the plant, the world turned to dust and darkness. The disaster had begun.
In the moments after the explosions, what was left of the control room was pure chaos and disbelief. The walls were gone, dust was everywhere, and yet the shift managers assumed the reactor was still intact. This denial was fueled by fatally flawed readings. The dosimeters that measure radiation were either buried in the rubble or only went up to a certain level before reading off scale. The true radiation levels in the areas nearest the core were later estimated to be around 20,000 Roentgens per hour, a lethal dose in under a minute. The first to face this invisible enemy were the plant's firefighters, who arrived at 1.28 a.m. They knew nothing about radiation, they just thought they were fighting a roof fire. Wearing no protective gear, they climbed onto the roofs, kicking away burning, highly radioactive chunks of graphite with their boots. Their bravery was immeasurable. Their fate was sealed. Of the first responders and plant workers who were hospitalized, 134 were diagnosed with acute radiation syndrome. 28 of them would die in the coming weeks, suffering unimaginable deaths as their bodies were destroyed from the inside out. As Pripyat slept, a small group of officials held an emergency meeting deciding only to block the roads into the city. For 36 hours, the Soviet government maintained a wall of silence, but radiation doesn't respect borders. On the morning of April 28th, over 1,100 kilometers away at a nuclear plant in Sweden, a worker set off a radiation alarm. The contamination was on his shoes, they first suspected a leak at their own plant, but soon realized the radioactive particles were unique to Soviet reactors. The wind was blowing from the southeast. Confronted by Sweden, the Soviet Union was finally forced to admit that an accident had occurred. Only then, at 2 p.m. on April 27th, did the evacuation of Pripyat begin. Residents were told it would be for just three days and to bring only essential documents. 1,200 buses streamed in, and in just three and a half hours, the city of nearly 50,000 was a ghost town. They would never return. In the following weeks, the evacuation zone grew, eventually displacing over 350,000 people. The disaster also left behind a landscape of myths, one of the most famous is the story of the three divers who supposedly swam through radioactive water on a suicide mission to drain a pool beneath the reactor. The reality is both less cinematic and just as heroic. The legacy of Chernobyl is written in hard data. If you found this factual breakdown of the events valuable, please consider sharing this video to help others understand the scientific reality of the disaster. In the comments, let us know what piece of data you found most shocking. Your engagement helps us continue to create documentaries that separate fact from fiction. To explore further, check the links in the description. You'll find the voiceover tool I used and a selection of powerful historical books that expand on today's topic.